Well, we have a newcomer, so let's do a little bit of review. <coughs> just not just to someone who's new here, but also to uh, test test how we've been doing the last couple of weeks. As Ben and I've been trading off, why don't we open up with a word of prayer? So that uh, certainly helps me focus and be aligned properly. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we enjoy your creation, but we also know we need we and it need the rains. And so we. Thank you that you can still drag us out of bed in the morning and get us here to enjoy time together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you in spirit and truth. And so I just ask that you would guide our time together as we reflect on your church and church history in your name. Amen. Amen. So if we were running through order, we've been going through different centuries. We've made it to about the right end of the 300s. We talked a little bit about uh, the canon of scripture last week. I, I want to try to get, one of the things I'm so hopefully some people lock in is different, just some different ideas through the centuries. And so do we remember about, the, so we've got the end of the first century, John writes what will be the last piece of admitted scripture into the, into the canon, Revelation, right at the end there between 95 and 98, and then actually we've got all the disciples passed away, most of them martyred by the end of that first century. So as we move into that second century, 100, and 100 plus, does anybody remember, can anybody name a couple of the early church fathers who came after the disciples? Any, 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 any little names? Jump, maybe in that first, I guess I should say first, second century, first century after the disciples. I had my notes with me, I would let you know. Yes, <laughs> say 200 is 2. Right. Second century is the 100 and somethings. So yeah, you have Polycarp, and you also have another man named Ignatius. Oh, and so they they definitely are, are in there. You get into the following century, so now you're in the 3rd century, 200, this and that. Uh, there is someone who is killed for their faith whose last name kind of really coins the term for what we call people who die for their faith. Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr. There you go. Yeah. We, have, we have Martyr. Yay! Yay. 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 I, don't, I don't mean to take him lightly, but he does help me, that, that does help me remember. <laughs> so we have Justin Martyr in the, in the third century, mm -hmm. and he actually there's another man, and if we're actually, there's, there's also, if you just remember a couple, these two are so after the disciples, there's a couple influential good lads, both of whom died for their faith, so we had, we had two martyrs before Justin, so Polycarp and Ignatius were guys really carrying the ball in that next century after the disciples, then we have Justin Martyr and a man who was trained by Polycarp, basically, so again, we have discipleship at play, and there's a man named... Arenas. And if we want to, as we get into these next centuries, then we're talking about sort of the safeguarding of the gospel. Keeping it tight. Keep making sure it's focused on, on what it really is. Because again, we don't have necessarily the confirmed list of which books you have this growing Christianity. So if you remember a couple people each time, Justin Martyr. This is where I actually say, so these guys carried the ball and died for their faith. As you get into the, the next century, it's like, well, what, what, are we, what are we contending with? And so if it's, it's a helpful devices here, what, what else is going on, of course, in Rome and Athens? What other philosophies and ideas are going on in those, those early days? You've got Greek and Romans, so you've got the philosophy of who? Aristotle. Aristotle. Plato. Plato. Plato is is the most influential pl player there. And so Justin Martyr would say, he would actually go on, kind of like we do even nowadays with some things like our film theology teaching and things where we, let's look at the narrative of scripture. 
Or like Paul does in Acts 17 when he walks into Athens and he starts quoting their poetry. Justin was actually not, he wasn't denouncing Plato, but he was trying to make sure, to, so you know, all the places where Plato's philosophy falls short or doesn't answer questions, they're fulfilled in Christ. So he was really dealing with that difference between, between you know, Greek, Athenian, the philosophies in their area, and how actually Christ answers all the questions. And so it's not unusual like apologetics and things we do now. Arrhenius was actually working against something very specific that Ben ended up talking about last week. Um, and it was a heresy where we actually <clears throat> really divides flesh and spirit. Very, very different look. Uh, it was a mystical sect, does anybody remember? And, and it actually, it, it's the idea of having secret knowledge. It's not Gnosticism, is it? Yes, Gnost Gnostics. So, so Plato and the Gnostics are kind of like, all right, so... <laughs> Two gold stars. <laughs> 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 wow. Look at that, we're, we're coming up with it. Like, so this, this is our early church history. We have, we have a couple men who, are, who carry the legacy of the disciples. It gets handed down to a couple more. So yeah, yeah, of course, there's so much more going on in hundreds. Look at, look at just our lifespan and things that happen in the church. But So we've got things going on second and third century. And so up until this point... Up until this point, uh, we then move into the next, we move into the 4th century, so now we're actually into the 300 and somethings. And somebody named another, somebody already named another uh, person, uh, started with a T. <laughs> Tertullian, alright. <laughs> Tertullian. Is there somewhere? Yeah, somewhere in the line. Now, as a, as a phonetic device, Tertullian, Tertullian actually gave us a term that actually doesn't appear in Scripture, but helped sort of coin a phrase and idea. Tertullian and the Trinity. So we got all, all this alliteration. So Tertullian gave us the term the Trinity. So he, he says Trinitas in his writings. So this is where we really begin to have this, not, obviously not for the first time, but in trying to address people questioning and talking about it, he gives it this term that we've now held for a long, long time. And we had we have a I'll, I'll stretch it, we'll do three, and then we'll jump into more of what's going on here. There was also a man named, lest we talk only about the good things that sneak into the church, there was a man named Clement, which might be a name you remember. And then also a man. Well, if we, let's, yeah, we're just going to put, uh, so Clement, what did Clement do? He was he trying, just like Justin Martyr, talking about philosophies, bringing things together. He, he also tried to reconcile some different beliefs and practices and sort of find a happy meeting ground. And so he actually created the idea of purgatory. <laughs> Which I don't think he should go to hell for, but maybe if there was some place he could just. Oh, no. Uh, just hold out for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, he actually came up with the idea of purgatory, which has obviously, I mean, it, it's still, depending on what, which Catholics you're talking to, and some actually don't believe in it, I, there's, there's variants of how many people actually hold to that, but uh, he read scripture more as allegorical than literal, and so. As he dreamed about how the universe works, he actually conceived and, and was gave, really helped to give that shape. Another man, though, so systematic theology, if somebody was going to be accused, in a good way, of really starting the idea, I mean, now we have so many books on systematic theology, where do you think the origin of that came from? That was, that was actually... Or, origin. Origin. There you go. See? That was, that was the word. <laughs> I thought you were just, I thought it was Oregon. So, so Tertullian, Clement, and Origen. So maybe you remember this as, as you guys are working through the idea of church history. Wait, if I can remember, okay, there's two guys, Polycarp and Ignatius, a couple guys carrying on the legacy of the disciples. Then Polycarp trains Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, who are working with, you know, Plato and philosophy and this Gnostic, Gnosticism. And then we get to the 4th century and Tertullian coins the term Trinitas, so now I have to remember three. See what I did there? Uh, 
Tertullian Clement and Origen. So, and we're dealing with, now here, Origen would bring in, uh, he also, Greek philosophy led him astray. Um, and he started believing in you know, pre existence of souls, like souls exist. He, he began working in Eastern concepts of things. So, you know, all these guys, you know, here, here we have all these guys are wrestling with scripture, but every time they sort of add or incorporate other things, uh, the, the church runs into some problems with that. So, that gets us to what we're going to talk about today, which is we, we've kind of been dancing around leading up to a pretty important date. And that was 312, and a man named Constantine. So as now we can more officially get into the next season of the church. Because as we, as we also talked about, I think the very, very first week, the church was not this always persecuted thing for the first three centuries. It actually went through cycles of acceptance and persecution. About every 10, and anywhere from 10 to 40 years, it sort of flip and switch. So we had 300 years of this topsy-turvy, no, the state is cool with you, no, we're going to burn you, and, and so we've got this. So then we have the rise of Constantine. So, in 312, that is that is a pretty big date. There's dramatic political change, kind of forever, in that sense. Uh, it was Constantine was preparing for a battle, and he, he recounts in his story that he looked, you know, and believe it or not, I, I look in my scripture, and I see some amazing manifestations. I see angels appearing before donkeys on the road. I hear uh, there, there's some plenty, plenty of amazing, miraculous appearances of God, and I don't think that those have somehow completely ceased. Uh, 312. He was looking up. He, he decided to pray to the supreme, pray to God for victory. As he was praying, he had a vision of a flaming cross that hovered in the sky, emblazoned with the words "Conquer by this." And so he, he believed that Christ had given him the victory. That's not so unusual. The stakes were a lot higher, but we had I mean, football players. We had sent, I mean, that's, we, we hear that from their mouths when, when football players or their team are, their team wins. Like, they, they give the glory to God for the victory. They believe he, he has enabled that or ordained that playing field to work out the way that, it, that he has decided. So uh, he then actually then in 313, so you've got 313, not to just work more more Trinity metaphors. So at 312, Constantine basically would, would recount as his conversion to Christianity. So we have the Roman Emperor, and then he has what is called the Edict of Milan. So I remember like, all right, so in the, in the 300s in the church, fourth century, What's a big thing that happens? This is probably the largest shift that happens. If there was one massive thing, 300 years had a lot of change and back and forth, but this now represents something supremely different. Uh, it granted Christians the right to worship, didn't just tolerate it, it restored them, them property and trade and allowed them to build buildings. So now we see, even to this day, uh, in a few places, I think the oldest one is a, a church from the 400. It's a Let's, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the church, but we actually got to visit. Yes, but, that's like it. No, it was a, one of the freestanding. It was, it was a. It was an Orthodox church. I actually got to pull across. Over there. Like I'll have to look it up. But there's an old church building standing from the 400. So mm -hmm. like that's we 300. So in the 313, is we actually see more building of buildings for worship. We actually see. Lots of different things. Now, Constantine didn't fully understand the doctrines of the church. Now, but then again, how many people in the congregation can say, in an average congregation, fully understand all the doctrines, much less the implications? He had a fierce temper. He had his wife and son put to death for charges of adultery, which some aren't, which aren't even proven necessarily that that was true or not. And he actually refused to be baptized until his deathbed which we see them cropping up as an idea. It's, he didn't originate the idea, but he's a prominent figure where we see there was, instead of seeing baptism as a sign of something, there was some mysticism instilled in it. And so people are actually waiting until late in life because that way the baptism would wash away all those prior sins. And so, of course, the longer you wait, if I get right for the deathbed, and that's perfect, my baptism wipe out all that stuff, there was not a concept of some of the concepts of what Christ really did on the cross, which ripples both directions in history, or 
the symbolic part of my baptism that also identifies me in both directions. There was, there was this idea that I had to wait. Which also then began to emphasize, when you look in the first couple of centuries of the church, church, even talking about baptism last week and why we baptize children into the church, um, but Baptists and others wait until it's what we call credo baptism. We actually say you know, we profess. I mean, you, you look at the early church, children are being baptized, babies are being baptized within them, I and you see this in the first few hundred years that's happening. The waiting till your adults seems to originate more, there's more counts of this idea where people are waiting, not because they believe they have to be able to profess their faith, but because they, they identify it with this idea of. Well, if I'm older, then it sort of whew, takes care of all those youthful indiscretions. Um, and then, of course, after the baptism, then, that, the, that would be, well, now I have to, what do I do for that? Well, I guess I have to go and then make sure I confess them all out every week to take care of it. And I can't forget one, lest I forget. Okay? That's where the idea of confession really almost then takes on its own mandatory, must perfectly do this quality. So that's why, you know, if the baptism wipes them all out, whew, then any you forgot. Do you see why you wait later? This is a weird thing that comes up. If you ascribe strange things to baptism, and then that need for you know, perfect confession afterwards, it's, it's where we do differ with some of our Catholic friends. But he, he also then, so what, what happens now is for the first time, Christianity has prestige, I mean, that's it's the emperor's thing, right? I mean, you're, it has respect. And as we know, certainly it's good, right? Now, as we know, when Christianity goes from persecution and all of its problems to having status and respect, it then has its own new set of problems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Constantine also saw himself a little bit as the 13th apostle. He, he sort of, it's, there, there was, you know... <laughs> Uh, but because, just like so, Constantine, though, just like another king who came after David, who was that? King Solomon? Constantine allowed a lot of his, his, as Solomon let his many wives and their pagan practices begin to influence and pervert his faith, uh, Constantine uh, let many of the practices of the pagans and his you know, Rome and all that begin to infiltrate Christian worship, uh, leading to you know, and just as you would have multiple gods and you had Zeus, but then many others, well, they were worshiping Christ and they would start to then venerate Mary and other men of the faith. So we actually, in, in the same way you have one god but a pantheon, there starts to be a little bit of a pantheon idea, even though they're not saying Mary's God, they're not saying the saints are God, but there is, they need an assembly and all of them need to be revered in some way. So it begins to Again, just sort of water things down. So, uh, so we also have, I think on your paper there, and we'll set up, uh, it's the rhythm of this teaching class had been last week, so we'll set up the players then, and then some of the stuff they worked through. So we'll work through some of the players of the century and some of the fathers, uh, fourth century fathers here. Because if Constantine has given a, a massive change, but as, of course, you know, Christians actually then we see become the persecutors instead of uh, rather than just being the persecuted. Pagan cults are outlawed to the point that uh, pagans are banned from the army, even sent, they sentenced to death people who denied the Trinity, and some, as, as, as I see in my notes here as a reminder, such are some of the dangers of allowing the state rather than God to govern, govern the church. So that's sweet. We have this inversion of persecution under state to now sort of church as part of state. And, and we're suffering in some ways, in different ways for that. And so we have Ambrose. So we have the Edict of Milan. And then we also have, floating out here as one of our church fathers in this time period, just if it maybe it'll even help lock some of that in, he is the bishop of, guess what? The bishop of Milan. So, we have Ambrose, who's coming out of that. He's a man of Rome. What he does, what he actually does probably best is, as, as they're moving through the 300s, 
Constantine passes things over, and the next emperor is Theodosius. And really, what Ambrose does best is, in the best possible way, he becomes an advisor to Theodosius. So he's influencing, he's influencing Christianity by having the ear of the emperor. And so, he, he really, if, if you're going to remember him for anything... He becomes an advisor to the emperor, and that is, not only does he advise the emperor, but then he also then advises somebody else, which we'll get to in a second here. He advises advisor to the emperor, mentor to a man named Augustine. So, if we hear, and you'll hear a lot, in fact, you hear a lot of quotes in this church and some of the past, not just myself, but even some of our other preachers will often draw on a quote from St. Augustine, as he is referred to. But uh, August, August, Augustine, or Augustine, people argue over that. <laughs> I go with Augustine. Uh, Augustine, or Augustine, wrote Confessions. He wrote The City of God. Uh, We'll talk about him in just a second, but Ambrose is sort of that first thing. So he's got the ear of the emperor as, as it moves from Constantine to Theodosius. He's sort of now kind of a spiritual to advisor to the upper echelon, kind of like we have today. Um, oftentimes the presidents do have some conversations with some of the, the public uh, evangelical figures, I mean, maybe prayer with, conversation with, whether they believe or not, sifting out what to think in those terms as far as the Christians in the nation. So Ambrose serves that function. And then we actually have a man, so he's, he's working on advising the people of God. Meanwhile, a man named Jerome, he's really working, I, I, if, if, I, if he's, we remember him for certain things, we begin to see that he actually gives us what is called the Vulgate, which becomes, that's the translation of the Bible. Standard translation used by the Roman Catholic Church, and it's a, this becomes the translation that is used by the church for a great lengthy time. Uh, probably good that he was working. Like, this guy's got the ear of people. Jerome is known for being cantankerous and combative, so he can stick with the book stuff. <laughs> he translates the Vulgate. He also was a man who did extensive commentaries. So I mean, now we have lots. So now, goodness, you can go online and. Go to a few websites and it'll have compare contrast dozens of commentaries. But here we actually see if Origen gave us our, one of our first notable stabs at systematic theology, uh, Jerome is really now, he's giving us a solid, a shared translation of the Bible and he's giving us biblical commentary. Which I mean, those are things we, we want to have a Bible study today. Most of, you know, a lot of times we'll try to streamline and have everybody use the same translation, and then we'll streamline up what commentaries to look up things we don't understand. So we begin to get with with Jerome this idea of that, uh, and he also served as a secretary uh, to one of one of the, the popes at the time. So again, like this, we see a lot of see a lot of, uh, of writing going on with Jerome. We see a lot of, of advising and working going on with Ambrose, but then probably the most influential, the most influential person in as much as the first thousand years of the church in many ways, where you're, if, if we based it on sermon quotes alone, uh, then we have Augustine. And Augustine, born in 350, so right in the middle, Right, so we've got a figure who comes into, into play in the middle, right in the middle of the 300s a small town of what's now Algeria. And he actually, he gives us, I mean, when a lot of people, you know, if you've, uh, have you read The Cross and the Switchblade growing up? Mm -hmm. I think you could. So in some ways we shouldn't love, in some ways we should love boring testimonies. <laughs> I was raised by God-fearing parents who instilled a rich sense of the word into me from the early age. God blessed me with his spirit. I have not walked perfectly, but I, those are the, but yet we all kind of admit there's, there's a part of us, just like the story of Saul becoming Paul, there is something amazing to that complete 180 degree turn. And so, other than, you know, so we've got Paul, 
And of course, then we've probably got our contemporary stories. But Augustine is really is well known from his book Confessions, as he spent his young adult years living a sinful life, even to the point of fathering an illegitimate son by a concubine. And then uh, I'll, I'll share a brief quote from him because it's helpful. It says, Now, in deep reflection, had drawn up out of the secret depths of my soul all my misery, and had heaped it up before the sight of my heart. There was a mighty storm accompanied by a mighty rain of tears. And not indeed in these words, but in this effect, I cried out to thee, And thou, O Lord, how long? How long, O Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? O remember not against us our former iniquities. He says, I was saying these things and weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart, and suddenly I heard the voice of a boy or girl, I know not which, coming from the neighboring house, chanting over and over again, pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it. So I quickly returned to the bench, for there I put down the apostle's book when I had left there. I snatched it up, opened it, and in silence read the paragraph on which my eyes first fell. Not, riot, not in riot and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and in, in envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I wanted to read no further, nor did I need to. For instantly, as the sentence ended, there was infused in my heart something like the light of full certainty, and all the gloom of doubt vanished away. Another, another famous quote from Augustine is, as he came to understand, our hearts are restless and do not rest until they find their rest. Uh, so he studied under Ambrose. So we've got the, the two A guys. Ambrose trains Augustine. He, he was actually a bishop in North Africa. And he had, he also had a strong fight. So he has one of those, you know, wildlife, tipped on his head, sin to salvation, conversions. And then he actually goes on to fight against a very strong heresy at the time. Anybody know this already? Let's see, if I, as far as your, as far as your early church heresies, if I, it starts with a P, and then it is? There we go. Pelagianism. So, So a man named Pelagius was a British monk, so you have North Africa versus Britain. A British monk, he denied original sin. So again, now we're here in the middle of the three, we're here in the mid to late 300s. And so again, when, when we think about, even today, when I say original sin, you're going to find churches that, uh, that, that, that ruffles a feather here and there. So here we have early in the church. He did, Pelagius denied original sin, taught that humans are born out. Now, how many people have heard this out of the mouths of a common American? People are basically good. Pelagius denied original sin and taught that humans are born basically good and, through enough effort, can attain perfection. It followed that since we're not true sinners, we don't need a true Savior. And so Christ did not die as a perfect substitute in our place, but really set a good moral example of what to follow. That is still, uh, you will find that in liberal Protestantism, ism, you'll find it in Mormonism, you'll find it in Christian science. Uh, so, again, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, people have the same little issues that, that creep into the church and those debates are the same things that have been going on since, since 370. So, Augustine really contended against Pelagianism. And so we've got these, these ideas. Now, these weren't just men fighting. It's not like they got in a ring and just argued and debated. This is where it's like, so these are the, these are the three players that I would say that. So I'll remember Constantine, obviously, as, as an emperor, he has a big conversion and really changes the face of Christianity, turns it into a thing that is now part of the kingdom. And then we have three figures, Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine, who sort of carry us through the different movements of that era. But then... In the midst of that, all these players played out against four very definitive councils, which I want to make sure that we hit. Uh, and, and actually, as you, as you hear some of these names, you might even recognize, oh yeah, as we say the blank creed here and there. So, uh, it's 
funny sometimes how I think it was Stephen Tedrow it was just sort of astounded last week that some of that it's like wait a minute we're still having these debates two thousand years later <laughs> like I, I thought this was something just our our generation was dealing with <laughs> that's, that's so good for the young people to see that yeah just yeah. keeps rolling you know yeah. <laughs> nothing new. So I think you have there on your notes there. I mean, and really, you've got these questions and counsels, and those totally you can just really draw a line to each one. So you've got the top one there, right? Is Christ divine? Is Christ human? If so, then how are those two elements combined? And fourth, what languages or terms do we use to describe them? So really, you have these four counsels moving over the course of the three hundreds into the four hundreds, and we're gonna end. They really were to address people coming up, or I like to say, maybe needlessly freaking out about <laughs> some of these issues. Uh, I I stand. I, you know, I'm the product. We're the product of our philosophy and our culture and our science and our understanding of, of many things. I I read some of these, and here's where I, I do feel like it, it feels different to me in some ways because I. Some of these questions, I think many of us just relax. Like your general congregant today, we just, we just so, don't you guys have some imagination? Like, why is this an issue? Like, he's fully God and fully man. But right? how far do I need to get into the weeds before I, before I hit a place of, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm, I freak out. I have to make a new, I have to come up with a new reason to explain this away. So uh, these things don't concern most of the church, but the reality is in subtle ways they do. Very subtle ways they do. So in every generation, there need to be some key figures that have those precise minds. I mean, you know, my my father-in-law is a Boeing engineer. If you left me to make sure a plane could fly right, uh, <laughs> we would we would have some problems. Uh, but certain minds need to make sure, even as that just works out to the casual ways we speak things from a pulpit, that those that becomes very important. And so the first first question. Is Christ divine? That was the Council of Nicaea. Now, many people hear, you hear the Council of Nicaea. Anybody else think of something else? Yeah. This is obviously the Nicaea. Again, so we have the Nicene Creed. Uh, but this was, and this was really the issue. Uh, so around, talk about this one. So it was about 318. Time-wise, so we're early in the 300s when this council came up and the players are in there. Uh, and somebody named Arius, which again there, some of you may have heard, if you, if you, maybe you've heard the phrase, you all sometimes hear the phrase Arian heresy, or the Arian heresy. So we have Arius here. Out of this, we have... Again, Platonic thought, in, in, in that trying to bridge cultures, you run a little too far with the pagan thought and start to then bend or break things that are in the faith you claim. Mm -hmm. He begins to propose that Jesus had been created, had not existed eternally, and could not therefore be divine like the Father. Mm -hmm. To me, that very simply contradicts John 1, where it says that the Word was with God in the beginning, the Word became flesh, that, but there's some very specific scriptures that would speak against that. Uh, but, and tell me this doesn't sound familiar, so if somebody who is bending the truth of Scripture, why is he getting any traction? A spellbinding orator and charismatic personality. <laughs> it's all it takes. The right person with the right smile and the right uh, bunch of charisma. Yeah. And we're going to, you know what? We, have, we live in a Christian culture even today where I mean, people are taking one verse and handling rattlesnakes, right, mm -hmm. in service. People are taking, and then you've got the charismatic personality, who would believe in this, and God will uh, bless your personal wealth, the health and wealth stuff. So, with the right teeth and the right voice, that means we can get a lot of it. Uh, the problem was, when this is happening, now this is when Constantine is the emperor, this is early in the 300s, Constantine was kind of sympathetic to this. Constantine, I mean, I remember how I mentioned he didn't have all his theology worked out well, so he's like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Uh, so a couple guys had to argue against it, and it was a man named Alexander. The guys who led the charge in this one were a man named Alexander and a man, 
spell this right here. Um, Athanasius. Which is also another creed term unit. Yeah. So we've got the Nicene creeds, we've got Athanasius, Athanasius Creed. Uh, and so, really, what we talked about the canon. And we talked last week about trying to do away with the idea that there was one singular time when everybody got together and just said, boom, that's it, these are the books. Uh, they, there was, it really occurs as much more of a process over those first three centuries of sifting, sorting. The reality is now Athanasius, out of this, I think Ben mentioned this last week, in, it's actually 367, where he actually, in a letter, uh, lists the books of Scripture. So that's why you'll hear a lot of people saying that the canon was, was, was kind of created at the Council of Nicaea. Or during this time, it's happening during this time that that, that was now certainly. If we want to make sure, Athanasius bases his defense against Arius on on several specific grounds here. One, he argued. I mean, he argued that the truth of Scripture says otherwise, Arius. So he's appealing to what is the confirmed and understood. He's appealing to a canon in his argument with Arius. He's appealing to one of these sets of books have authority over you and your ideas, so we must submit to them. So the truth of Scripture is really his argument. So he is, in one sense, confirming the canon. And then he actually, then we see him listed in 367, which is where we really see it historically. Somebody's actually said, hey, we, we've read a record of that. So Constantine was sympathetic. Alexander and Athanasius persuaded that God is the same substance as God the Father. And... So he, he, he works with that. Um, now, once again, Arius' appeal, he, Arius' appeal, is, his appeal is to the logic of monotheism. Mm -hmm. And we still have that. In Islam, which Muhammad, in 650, Muhammad will come out and push back on the idea, he will move from Yahweh to the, his idea around Allah, and Jesus will not be divine. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Honestly, they, they, Jesus is a recreated Archangel Michael and not truly one with the Father. So they, downgrading Jesus has been happening since Arius. Uh, now sometimes you want to go the other way, right? So a man named, then we have the Council of Constantinople. Council of Constantinople, the Apollinarians, led by a man named, surprise, Apollinarius, uh, they denied that Christ had a human soul. That's like, well, okay, you can't, oh, wait a minute, so then he's fully divine, he doesn't, he's just God, uh, he's God in a body, right? I mean, he's, he's he, he, he doesn't, he can't possibly then have a, a human soul, because it's really just God in this fleshly form. Like, well, this is where I think some of us start to wonder why we need to be parsing this so tightly. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, it's, well, was he fully human then? Or was he just sort of this, this possessed flesh with, with God inside? Was he, was he fully a human? It's like, well, he says he was born, he, he, he sympathizes. Again, you start appealing to scriptures that I know. His ability to sympathize with our weaknesses, to, to be tempted in every single way. Well, it's like, well, that, no, he is to be literally you know, gestated and born of a woman, it's like, no, he's, he's fully human. He cried. He fell. Yeah. 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 He, we, it just, so, Council, Council of Constantinople rejected both that heresy, and, and again, they, they, tried to, they tried to elevate Christ, he didn't have a human soul, but then also deny the full divinity of the Holy Spirit. So they're trying to say, Father and Son are God, but not, now we're, we're going to downgrade this idea of the Spirit. So, again, you're just, people want to mess with the, the Trinitas, which has been coined, they, 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 it's, it's confusing, right? There's no perfect metaphor for it. It doesn't make perfect sense to our brains. So this has been the wrestle. Trying to, really you're not understanding God, uh, creates arguments in the bank. <laughs> Big surprise. Uh, 
Council of Ephesus. Uh, now, by the time we get to four, now see then this was three eighty one. Uh, then we actually have. We, then we actually roll over to the next century. So now we're in 400, 431. We sort of... Council of Ephesus. And at 431, so, we've, we act, so we spend the 300s really figuring out Christ's humanity, what's, what we call it now, we often say the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man. How does that sort itself out? Uh, how, it, how does that sort itself out becomes the question in the 400s. All right, we're not going to argue whether he's fully God or fully man, but if he was full both God and man, how are the two elements related to each other? And so that was what the Council of Ephesus came up and tried to figure out. And once again, that's because somebody somebody's arguing very differently. There's a, a man named Nestorius became bishop of Constantinople. He couldn't bring himself to believe that the divine had either been born or crucified. Probably because you're putting something messy or dirty or just too human around birth, or then having to be killed. Muhammad would have the same thing too. Like, different, like, well, wasn't actually killed on a cross. Like, the, the prophet, I mean, there's, we have problems with him actually being killed. Uh, he railed against the idea that the eternal God could ever have been three days old and saying at one point, God is not a baby. So you get hung up on these particular ideas and issues. Uh, but fortunately, as I, mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, Ambrose, who was the advisor to the emperor after Constantine, Theodosius. So Emperor Theodosius II would intervene with this. He'd be fed up by this. So again, we see that the emperor is fed up with the church squabbling. Partially also because he has the ear, he's advised by spiritual counsel as hey, you guys are making a mess, you're having you're, you're creating schisms. You know, we call these things denom potentially denominational splits today. I mean, like these he he had uh, both the guys who were arguing, the guy named Cyril, he had arrested and declared the they, they were excommunicating people from their churches. He just declared it all void. And he cited uh, not unfortunately. Messy resolution. They, they, they didn't really resolve it. The emperor just sort of said, knock it off. <laughs> so, Council of Ephesus, uh, where there was a big council, but ultimately the emperor actually came in and kind of pushed against that. And so, uh, that was actually not fully resolved. So, the Council of Chalcedon, then, which is 450, 451, I think. Uh, so, once again, and this, this again, this is how specific it gets. A monk in Constantinople argued Christ's incarnation had two natures, but after his incarnation, these two unions were thoroughly blended, the human nature being dissolved into the divine, as much as a drop of wine is dissolved into the sea. The nature of Jesus, therefore, was then neither perfectly divine nor perfectly human. <laughs> Emperor Theodosius learned of this latest controversy in the East, called the Council in 449 to settle this. And there was anger, chaos. That was 449. So the council was called, it all went south. So like when, you have a so when you have a church meeting, and it ends with people storming out and no clear resolution and everything goes crazy. So here, here's one of those times where let's get to end with a little God providence story. The next year, the, the problem was, so Theodosius, the emperor, up until this day, he's been helpful at this point. You guys fix your problems, quit squabbling, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, what happened is Chaos and division. Theodosius wasn't really helping out in this one, and he, his, his actions didn't help, and in fact, he wasn't even sure where he stood. The next year, the horse that Emperor Theodosius was riding stumbled, and the emperor fell and broke his neck. 
The new emperor succeeded Theodosius, affirmed the orthodoxy of Christ, and immediately called for a new council at Chalcedon and across the river from Constantinople in 451. So the first thing the new emperor does, she's like, oh my goodness, we just had a horrible life. Somebody's just in, a, you know, now be a car wreck, but you know, we just had a horse wreck. Emperor's dead. I gotta take the reins. It's the first thing I'm gonna do. We must fix this. So he calls, uh, he calls for a council of Chalcedon. And this time we actually have the idea, as it is quoted uh, in the Tome of Leo, not that you need to remember that, but as with this, the idea of Christ, declaring Christ to be a single person, perfect in Godhead and perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, in two natures, inconfusedly, immutably, indivisibly, inseparably. Also that Christ came so that death might be conquered, and so that the devil who once exercised death's sovereignty might by his power be destroyed. For we would not be able to overcome the author of sin and death, unless he whom sin could not stain, nor death could not hold, took on our nature and made it his own. <laughs> so, again, extra-biblical systematic theology applications being written down they will really clarify these things. And as the, the conclusion, as we can pray and join people for prayer. Uh, so the Council of Chalcedon really, I'm going to write that down. So now we're about 450 years, and it is Chalcedon. It's this council, the 450. Again, we sort of moved from the Council of Nicaea in the early 300s. It was 323 or 25, I keep forgetting. 25. But there you go. So, for about 125 years, we have the idea of Scripture being confirmed very much down until we see the Old and New Testaments are settled. 300, over 125 years, we're fighting all these heresies over the nature of Christ. Chalcedon, what, it, it, what, I, like, uh, what I like this one commentator says, Calcadon laid down the fences guarding the orthodox doctrine of Christ as one person, fully God, fully man, yet it resisted the temptation to define precisely what cannot be precisely defined. <laughs> the Apostle Paul several times describes the gospel as a mystery, and at its core is the mystery of how God becomes a man. And so scripture keeps in mind, in Revelation, we hear what does John say we should do to scripture? We should add to it, right? Right, Yeah. Never. We don't add to scripture. So every time people say, well, it doesn't precisely define the Trinity, I will give it more definition. It doesn't precisely describe how Christ, how God becomes man and, and what that really means of his nature, I cannot add. I can't add. Or we're going to wind up in these places. And so we have to leave Mr. My, my friend, uh, Cindy Tabey. You know, she, grew up, she grew up in a church where that was always the answer you got as a kid. Well, then why this? Or why God? What's a mystery? It's a mystery. She always felt like it was placating her. So I, we shouldn't offer that as, as a lazy excuse, but there are simply places in Scripture, as we've seen battles, excommunication, even death, it's always because we're adding or trying to clarify the places where we should just yield and say, it's a mystery. So, thanks for listening this morning. Let's go uh, pray with our folks and uh, we can have the main worship service in a minute. In fact, we'll pray with them, so I will, I will reluctantly not, I'm not going to close a prayer here. We can pray over there. So let's get wandering over into the sanctuary and pray with them.